Behind me now is the Charlie Wall House, and it was here that he ran his operation, his Bolita Kingpin, his prostitution rings, and he basically controlled the criminal underworld of Tampa. Now his story is fascinating. He was actually killed here April 18th, 1955. His father was a former mayor of Tampa, and his wife was the daughter of obviously a different former mayor of Tampa. But when he was growing up, his stepmother was very abusive towards Charlie Wall, so he developed mental problems and as a young man he shot her and killed her. Well because of this, even though he was a very promising young student, they sent him off to a military school but he was kicked out because he was visiting brothels. He was going and seeing women on the street. So they kicked him out and he came back here and he quickly took up a criminal operation by roaming the streets of Ybor and teaming up with the cigar makers. Well as an early criminal enterprise, Charlie Wall managed to incorporate all different elements. He incorporated Cubans, he incorporated Italian, Italians, Irish, Russians, and he was an all-around criminal empire. And then around the 1920s and 30s, the white-collar criminal empire of Charlie Wall was challenged by a tough-as-nail Sicilian mobster, Ignazio Antinori. Now, Ignazio comes along, and he's a little bit more willing to get down and dirty. Charlie Wall, he had married into political families, and he didn't really, as far as I can tell, deal in drugs, even though he, of course, was willing to kill a few people and be down and dirty and possibly deal in drugs. But Ignazio got his career started because of drugs. In fact, what really boosted him was the fact that he organized basically a tunnel of heroin going from southern France to Havana, Cuba, and then up along the coast by coordinating with corrupt government officials. And because of this, he almost immediately declared open warfare on Charlie Wall, and what followed was two decades of violent gang wars, which the Traficante family, as far as anybody can tell, because this was all kept very secretive for many years, basically sat on the sidelines of. The slow march of time seems to destroy so many historic sites because here, up until a few years ago, you had the facade of the Yellow House, which was built to consolidate Charlie Wall's early control over Ybor, Tampa, and St. Petersburg. It was a Bolita racketeering operation, and in the roof of this operation, you had a brothel. Well, they said that during Wall's tenure here, about 25 to 30 people might have actually been killed, while the Traficante family mostly sat that whole period out and came into control of Yellow House a couple years after. Well, in 1950, uh, Primo Lazaro, who was a capo for this family, he was, well, one of his bodyguards was going out the back with $2,000 in Bolita checks. Somebody comes up and robs him at gunpoint, and when they talk to the news, an unidentified person said, we already know who did it. We're waiting for, basically, a request for action. But where I'm standing right now was the epicenter for both Charlie Wall and the Traficante operations up until a few decades ago. Looking for old souvenirs from this place. This seems to be a little bit too big to take home, but perhaps I could take home a chunk of the floor. And to think, this could have had blood spilt on it back in the 30s. Mostly under wall is when the blood was flowing here in Ybor and Tampa. That's a bit of their acrylic floor. And these chickens are running around all over the town. It's kind of interesting how close we are to a highway and how many of them there are. Antonori was killed, a lot of people think, by the Chicago outfit because he was sending them shipments of heroin and they sent him back a complaint saying you gave us unpure product and we want a refund. Well, he said no and he was drinking coffee with a friend and a young female companion in town and up walks an unknown gunman who shoots him twice in the back of the head with a shotgun and that ended the criminal enterprise of Antinori. Well, Charlie Wall from this point is getting a little bit older and he says, I want to sit all this out. I'm done with my criminal enterprise. I might, you know, do a little bit here on the side with the bolitas, but I'm going to mostly sit this out. And this is 1706 16th Street, where the Bolita Kingpin of St. Petersburg, Charlie Williams, was shot down on February 18th, 1953, at 9 p.m. Basically, he found himself rapidly rising in the ranks of Ybor and St. Petersburg's criminal underground. In 1933, police raided his home, found a bunch of Bolita equipment, but no cash. And then in 1937, he was raided again, 
and they found $50,000, but no Bolita equipment, meaning that he was at that time basically the king of this area. And then in 1953, about a week after Santo Traficante Sr. had an assassination attempt on his life, he was shot and killed. Perhaps on orders from the Traficantes, perhaps on orders from somebody else, but he was a uh, kingpin of the Bolita games. He was running a racket out of this town, and of course, he was shot in the chest as he made his way over from a shaving parlor right over here near Central Ibor. Now, eventually, Santo Traficante Sr. emerged as the leader, basically, of Tampa and Ibor and St. Petersburg's underground. He was operating a bunch of different businesses, which he drew a lot of money from legally, but also he was on the corrupt side of things and dealing drugs and bolitas as well, as far as anybody knows. Of course, this is all speculated, but he eventually goes to the wayside and his son, Santo Traficante Jr. comes up. And again, all speculation, but after Antinori's empire fell, all that was left to challenge the Traficantes was Charlie Wall. Now, Wall was basically in retirement, but on the morning of April 18th, 1955, somebody walked into his house and uh, beat him to death with a baseball bat before slitting his throat, a classic mob operation. In fact, there's very classic photos of his body being led out the front of his house, and this left the Traficantes in firm control of all of Tampa's criminal underground, and basically their fingers were in the pies of a lot of government officials, leading them to the CIA, which I'll actually tell the story of over at Traficante Jr.'s grave right over here. And after Charlie Wall and Ignazio Antinori had duked it out for a couple decades, the only man really left standing was Santo Traficante Sr. and Charlie Wall, who was basically living in internal exile. He had retired and gotten out of the business and might have been doing a couple things on the side, but he didn't really make a dent in the Traficante's business operation. Well, Santo Traficante Sr. ran this entire empire very, very quietly, and he also inherited a good number of things. From Ignazio, he inherited a ruthless business mentality, and from Charlie Wall, he inherited a degree of white collar element to his operation. He would work with Cuban immigrants as well, something which he considered to be patriotic. He, he figured everything he did to help the Cubans was because he was an anti-communist, as a lot of Italians were. And when his son came to be the head of the operation, after Traficante Sr. died basically of old age during a heart operation, his son started his tenure with a bang. A lot of people think, although it's not confirmed, that he ordered the hit on Charlie Wall in 1955, but again, there's no evidence to support that, and I actually think that that's kind of out of the character of the more white-collar Traficante family. In fact, I, I actually think that this family is a very interesting group of people, and of all elements involved, I would say them and Charlie Wall are pretty respectable in terms of what they did. After inheriting the criminal empires of Charlie Wall and Ignazio, Santo Traficante Sr. and his son Jr. took them over and ran them more as a white-collar empire. They demanded a higher degree of honor and respect. Now, Traficante Jr. began approaching the Bonanno family of New York, as well as Sam Giancana, who became very famous in JFK conspiracy circles for a reason that you'll see in a minute. Now, in 1957, it became very obvious that Cuba was a fragile state, so he and 60 other men were arrested in upstate New York at what police called an organized crime conference. One of the things that was up on the table for discussion is what to be, what's, what's to be done in Cuba. So Traficante Jr. had decided to go down and open up a number of casinos, hotels, and businesses, and alongside him were other American businessmen who were not corrupt. They were just down there for legitimate business, and the dictator of that country, Batista, was very happy to have them. In fact, Traficante Jr. had a very close relationship with Batista. Now, after Fidel Castro took over, the revolutionaries, the terrorists, began killing most business owners that they considered corrupt. And of course, their first order of business was to steal all the money from the Traficante family's accounts. Now, I've heard from some people in the community that he developed a hero worship cult around him, basically because he helped a lot of Cuban refugees escape from that communist terror that was happening. So in the 1960s, 
he was approached by an FBI agent who had retired, and this FBI agent was approached by the CIA. And the CIA said to this guy, go to Trepicante and say that you're a retired businessman and that you'll offer him $150,000 to kill Fidel Castro. He testified on the House Committee of Assassinations in 78 that he was a patriotic American. And the work that he did with Cubans, he considered to be a part of that. He was a, an Italian first and a patriotic American second, and that he would never kill JFK. But it didn't help him that around that time, one of his former friends came forward and said, oh, well, I was having this meeting with him, and I said, how about that JFK guy? He's not really helping our interests down in Cuba. And apparently, Traficante Jr. said, oh, don't worry about him. He's going to be whacked. Now, of course, plenty of people say this in passing, just sounding tough. I don't feel that Traficante Sr. or Jr. would have ever made a target on JFK. But that was enough to get him implicated, as well as his business dealings in Cuba. And uh, again, he lived up until 1987 and died a very elderly man. And after he died, because of course, if you did this before he died, he might remind you who's boss. His lawyer came forward and said that he and Jimmy Hoffa were plotting to kill JFK. Now, of course, that's all very good if you want to write a book. But I don't feel that Traficante ever had any business in JFK. He might have helped the Cuban refugees, the Cuban rebels, given them some guns. He might have organized a lot of, you know, Alpha 66 Brigade, the, the brigade that did the Bay of Pigs. He might have provided a lot of funding for that, but he never would have killed the president, in my opinion. So uh, he's buried here, just across the cemetery from his father, Traficante Sr. And here's an interesting grave in the same cemetery where the Traficantes are buried. Sergeant Nick Mattesini, who gave his life on December 7th, 1944, so close to Christmas, in service of his country. Now, I'm wondering why this is the only monument in the cemetery that the head is knocked off of both. At least in the Italian immigrant communities, a lot of people were very divided over our invasion of Italy. In fact, look no further for the only other broken heads in the cemetery than this man's parents. I wonder if he had made enemies in the local community or if it was a decision about war because there are several other memorials for people who've died in this cemetery.